So friends, uh, good morning to you on this uh, Good Friday morning service. Um, I'm so grateful to be able to connect with you online this morning on uh, Good Friday. Uh, we're entering the third week of our uh, national lockdown to curtail the spread of the coronavirus in South Africa. And for many of us, this has been a time of reflection, an opportunity for us to ponder our hopes, to give thanks for what is good in life, but also to face our fears, to consider the reality of our mortality, and to work out how we will live in the midst of suffering and of death. And these are all very important themes for our Lenten and our Easter journey. And in particular, they're very fitting for a Good Friday service. As you may remember, we would have had uh, two services today, a regular worship service in our sanctuary, followed by a service of remembrance for all of those who have lost loved ones in the previous year and indeed in the years before that. And so we'll include that, uh, both of those aspects in our service today and just to say this is intended to be a quieter more meditative reflective service uh, than normal so i invite you please when we go into silence don't be uncomfortable uh, in that uh, even if uh, we grow quiet um, you should be able to to just enjoy the time in god's presence now, because the service is intended to be a more quiet and reflective service, we're going to start with the notices, and uh, then once we've done that, we'll light the candle and move into the rest of the service. So the first uh, thing I'd like to remind you of is that we will have our live stream of the Easter Sunday ser uh, service. It'll be here on Coronation Avenue Methodist Church's Facebook page at 9 a.m. Uh, Courtney and I are preparing uh, something special. We are, we are hoping to uh, sing uh, a song of, of celebration uh, with you, for you. So uh, do come for that service. And who knows, uh, I believe that the Easter Bunny uh, is a critical uh, worker. And so we may even find that there are a few Easter eggs around. I've been uh, off chocolate for Lent. So what a day that's going to be. So come along at nine on Sunday morning. Then um, I heard from Ralph that our presiding bishop, Reverend Purity Malinga, will be doing a broadcast service today at 12.30 on channel 334. And our general secretary, uh, the Reverend uh, Hansrod, will lead the Easter Sunday service on Sunday at 12.30, uh, also on channel 334. So uh, if you have access to those channels, do tune in with the rest of uh, our Methodist sisters and brothers. Thirdly, um, just to remind you that all collections that are taken across Southern Africa on Good Friday always go towards the Ministerial Students Fund. In other words, the income goes towards the training of ministers for our church. And that's an investment in the kingdom and uh, in, in our work for the future. So we would encourage you to give uh, generously. Um, you'll see that on our Facebook page, there is a, a snap scan uh, image. Um, and uh, I will make this whole transcript of today's service available as a link um, afterwards and um, you can either use SnapScan to make your gift today or use the electronic uh, uh, transfer into the bank account. Two last notices, we rece received an urgent plea from our brother Andy Lawton uh, who we know and love very much, who's working with the Helderberg Street people, Thomas House of Hope and the night shelter. They're trying to care for about 100 to 120 people housed at a school near the shelter. And uh, Andy is asking local churches to help us to prepare meals, uh, say once a week, depending on how many churches can help. There's enough food until today, but we need to continue at least until the lockdown ends. So um, we would like either for folks to provide dishes of pasta, mince, soya or soup, uh, anything that's nutritious and the church will provide bread from our disaster fund depending on the needs we can uh, contribute ingredients so if you would like to respond uh, we've asked that you please uh, either cook something and be in touch uh, with the church office the number for the church office is uh, in the in it will be uh, in in the link here or otherwise if you can make a contribution into the church's bank account and just use the reference disaster fund and uh, that will go towards supporting these persons. And then lastly, just to say, please also keep our minister, the Reverend Ralph Afghan, in your prayers. 
Ralph was asked by our Bishop Yvette Moses to head up the Synod uh, Crisis Task Team for the COVID-19 response. He's been working very hard uh, behind the scenes to secure food and shelter and care for people um, who, who are most vulnerable during this time. So please keep Ralph in your prayers um, as, as he undertakes that, class, uh, that task. So friends, those are our notices for today. I'm going to invite us to uh, be silent for just a moment. And then I'm going to invite our society steward for the day uh, and also our camera person, uh, who also happens to be my wife and my boss, Megan, to come and uh, light the candle. So let's grow quiet just for a moment um, as we prepare ourselves in worship. Thank you, Minky. There we go. Thanks, Minky. Let us pray. So as we gather, let's light this candle, remembering that we are with Christ and that he is with us in suffering. It's a dark day to be gathered here, Jesus. It's a barren place and it's filled with shadows and death. But we are here because we need to be here. The shadows of this day are our shadows. The death is our death. Now as we worship, your cross becomes for us a mirror, reflecting back to us our own brokenness, sinfulness and darkness. And as we reflect on your love-inspired sacrifice, we discover an open doorway to life. We gather at the foot of your cross because we desperately need to be here. Amen. Now, sisters and brothers, our scripture reading for today is a very long reading. Uh, it comes to us from John chapter 18, verse 1 to chapter 19, verse 42. So I'm not going to read the whole scripture reading uh, for us this morning, but I do want to invite you, please take some time during the day today and go and read that reading. John chapter 18, verse 1 to 19, verse 42. And it's the account of Jesus' last moments before the crucifixion, the crucifixion itself, and then him being placed within the two. I'll give you just a brief summary of what we cover in that reading and then read a portion. The reading starts in John chapter 18, verse 1, with Jesus and his disciples moving towards Jerusalem. And as it grows dark, they are met by Judas, one of the disciples, who is there with some soldiers and the chief, chief priests from the temple and the Pharisees who had come to arrest Jesus. Then we enter into that remarkable narrative that John tells of Simon Peter, who at first is full of courage, charging a guard with his sword. And then just a few verses later, we see that he is, Jesus is taken to Annas, the son of Caiaphas, the high priest. And Peter is fearful when he is asked by a servant whether he is one of the Lord's disciples. And in fact, he openly denies Jesus. John contrasts Peter's lack of courage with the courage of Jesus who testifies about who he is and what ministry he's been sent to do. Without fear or shame, Jesus addresses Annas. Now to draw the contrast, John once again returns to Peter who denies Jesus a second and a third time, as was prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. Next, Jesus is led from Caiaphas to, uh, to Pilate, the Roman governor. And between verses 28 and 40, we read that Pilate wasn't all that certain of the charges that were brought against Jesus. He questioned their validity. And so he questions the high priests and the Pharisees and even tries to get Jesus released by offering them and the crowds a choice between freeing this man, Jesus, or choosing to release a known murderer. But as we know, in verse 40, the, child, the crowds choose B Barabbas instead of Jesus. 
Still trying to appease his conscience, Pilate has Jesus tortured physically by whipping him and placing him, placing a crown of thorns and a mock robe around him, but also tortures him emotionally by allowing him to be mocked as the king of the people who are calling for his death. And after his torture, he asks them, do you want me to crucify your king? To which the Jews, who hated the Romans, respond, we have no king except the emperor. And Jesus is handed over to be crucified in John chapter 19, verse 16. Now we're going to read just a portion of the rest of the narrative from John chapter 19, verse 16 to 30. And uh, I'm reading from the New International Version. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side of him and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what a remarkable testimony, listen to this, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven into one piece from the top to the bottom. Let it not tear, they said to one another, let's decide by lot who will get it. And this happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this was what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, the disciple whom he loved nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. It, it for me is so remarkable that even in this time of great suffering, Jesus looks out for the good of those whom he loves. Verse 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and they lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, after this, we read that John concludes the story by helping us, the readers, to understand that Jesus was truly dead. He also reminds us that the body of Jesus was not broken. And as you would have seen throughout this passage, the reason for this is he's trying to help us to see that Jesus is the one whom the prophets had spoken about and all the prophecies had come true. Jesus truly is the crucified Messiah. Finally, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who we met in our first Lenten service in John chapter 3, get permission from Pilate to remove Jesus' body. And with great love and care, they take his body and prepare it according to Jewish customs, and they place Jesus in the tomb. Let's take a few moments in silence to reflect on what we have just heard.
Now let me ask you a question. Do you think that Jesus lived to die? Or did he die in order to bring life to all? Now, this question is more than just semantics. It opens up our faith to the reality that what Jesus came to do was not about death so much as it was about life and life in all its forms and possibilities. Jesus died because he refused to accept a lesser life, a life of evil, of compromise, and of expediency. Jesus died because he embraced a life of love fully and completely. And he died because he wouldn't be moved from that life of love. And in so doing, Jesus showed us what it is to fully live. And he gave us an example to follow and a way for us to enter life. Now next we can ask what our response is to Jesus' death. What Jesus did was not simply to give us a ticket to heaven. Rather, he opened the door for us to be forgiven. And in order to be forgiven, we have to face our own darkness and brokenness. That's what we need to do in order to live fully as he did. If we also die to everything that keeps us from real, abundant and full life and embrace the life of love. Good Friday confronts us with what life is really meant to be and with the price that we must pay to find it, which in the end turns out to be much smaller than it may first appear. Now, some people believe that religion is irrelevant to the big issues of our world. However, what Jesus does goes to the very heart of the crises that we face as people and a species and even as a planet. Think about it, particularly at this time, as we face the COVID-19 pandemic. One of our greatest fears is the fear of death. We worry about having enough to meet our daily needs and for those, particularly the poorest and the most needy amongst us, to have their needs met. Sadly, as we've seen, some of us turn to looking out only for ourselves and not worrying about others. In a world of disease, Jesus breaks the conventions of religion and culture, as we read during our Lenten series, and he does this to bring wholeness and flourishing to people. In a world of corruption in the halls of power, Jesus exposes the expediency and manipulation. And for that, he dies with integrity. In a world of poverty, Jesus gives up everything in order to offer his life for others. He chooses not to become the kind of king that the world wants that is here today and gone tomorrow, but he chooses to be the kind of king who confronts the world with what matters most. He confronts them with the challenge to live in ways that encounter the brokenness of the world. And that means being where the broken are. And while some may view his love as weak, the Sunday service that we will celebrate in just two days reveals for us that it is indeed the strongest power in all of history and all of creation. The love of Jesus is the power to defeat all other powers. So what does this say to us about being Easter people today? Well, a Christianity that is about nothing more than a guarantee of personal forgiveness and eternal life is exactly the antithesis of what Jesus came to do. It is selfish and escapist and unloving. And it removes us from any cost and deceives us into believing that all we have to do is agree with a set of ideas and then sit back and wait until we get to heaven. Good Friday helps us to realize that that view is just a delusion. Jesus confronts us with selfishness and self-protectiveness at every turn. He challenges us with his willingness to give his life in order to love even 
his enemies. Remember that Jesus died for all, even the soldiers who cast lots for his clothes, even Caiaphas and Pilate, even Judas who betrayed him. And Jesus disrupts our comfort by mirroring back to us through the cross the extent of our depravity and our collusion in small ways in the systems of the world. And he invites us into a different way of living. He opens for us today the possibility of living a life which doesn't seek to escape suffering, but that offers the very best of what it means to be a Christ follower in the midst of uncertainty and brokenness and even in the face of death. You see, friends, that is true hope. Jesus leads us into abundant life that's not based on how much we have in our bank account. It's not based on our titles or positions. Jesus invites us into a life of love. And he says that we don't have to live that life alone. As we refuse to settle for what is less than true and what is inauthentic, Jesus promises to bless us with the greatest gift of all, the gift of love. Let's take a moment in quiet to reflect. Let us pray. Lord, it seems impossible that anyone would give what you did to save women and men like us. Yet you gave yourself freely for our sakes. It seems unimaginable that anyone could love as much as you did, even loving the outcasts, the rebels, and even your persecutors, and yet you refuse to strike back. But today we thank you that we have learnt that you loved us so much that you laid down your life for all of us. It seems inconceivable that anyone would offer forgiveness that you did, even as the nails pierced your, your flesh and the cross was stained with your blood. But you did not hold our sin against us and took it on yourself in suffering that should have been ours. Forgive us that we have allowed greed and violence and pride and deceit and bitterness and selfishness and coldness to find a place in our hearts. And Lord, fill us again with your immeasurable grace, with your inexhaustible love with your un unconquerable life, that we may be changed and may express our love and devotion through lives of worship for you. Let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, we are now moving towards the end of our service, and soon we will extinguish this candle. And this serves for us as a reminder that Jesus' life was extinguished out of love for us. After we have extinguished the candle, we'll have our closing prayers, and then I will end the service in silence. And I invite you to reflect quietly upon your life, as I will reflect upon mine, on our need for redemption, for renewal, for forgiveness, and for love. But let's also reflect on the gift of God that is given to us all on this day through Jesus' life, his suffering, 
and his death. So come, let us pray. If the cross tells us anything, O Lord, it is that you know and you share our suffering. You are with us, and you are with all who are victims of disease, victims of violence or abuse, victims of our own ignorance, foolishness, and sin. And so we pray, Lord, help us and restore us. You are with us and all those who inflict pain on others and on the world through our selfishness or greed, through our brokenness or anger, through our rigidity or our need to be right. Help us and restore us, Lord, we pray. Lord, you are with us and all those who are fearful of the threats to this world that we call home. You are with all of us who worry for our health, our survival and our safety, who fear the breaking of our community and our sense of togetherness as a people. Lord, we pray, help us and restore us. Lord, you are with all of us who grieve the loss of loved ones, of parents and children, of sisters and brothers, of friends and colleagues, and at this time, the hundreds of thousands whom we do not even know. We thank you, loving God, that in Christ, death is not the end. We thank you for the lives of those who have lived with us and have now gone on to eternity. And we pray that was good, whatever was good in their lives, whatever was admirable, whatever was courageous, whatever was loving and whatever was true, that you would inspire us through their life and witness. We pray particularly for those who have lost loved ones during this last year. And we pray, Lord God, that in their mourning, you would offer them comfort and peace. Christ of the cross, see our need for your grace, hear our prayer for your mercy, <clears throat> and come to us again. Help and restore us, because we acknowledge that we cannot heal ourselves. Amen. And so, sisters and brothers, as we move through the tradeum these three days of Easter, Good Friday, the quietness of the tomb that comes to us on Holy Saturday, and the celebration and thanksgiving for life that comes to us on Easter Sunday. May the Spirit of Christ be close to you. May his love be your experience. And may his grace strengthen and sustain you. I will now offer the final blessing on this Good Friday, and then we'll let the video run for just a moment or two and invite you just to sit in silence together with me. And then I invite you to move into your day and do so in the comfort and love and grace that you know that comes from Jesus. And if you get a chance, please do read the reading that we shared this morning and reflect on it. So receive now the blessing. In your cross, O Christ, we see your incredible love. 
In your death, O Lord, we discover your irrepressible life. In your suffering, O Saviour, we find that we are saved. Thank you for leading us out of darkness into your marvellous light. Now lead us into the world as agents of love, of light and of salvation. Amen.